because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media on Twitter at Bball Immersion or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach is super excited today to have Mark Cassio here. Long overdue to have Mark on the podcast, a good friend of mine and good friend of Basketball Immersion as well. And Coach Mark Cassio enters his 15th season as a head basketball coach and his ninth season at Catholic High School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And during his tenure at Catholic High School, the basketball program has experienced unprecedented success of five district titles and three Final Four appearances. Prior to that, uh, Mark won a uh, state championship in Louisiana at Christian Life Academy in 2012. And Mark, most of us know him from his modern mentorship for modern basketball through his business courtside consulting. And in the last year, Mark has conducted hundreds of webinars, hundreds literally, and traveled the country leading clinics for coaching staffs ranging from professional to high school levels. And uh, I've been very fortunate to be a part of some of these clinics and some of these Zoom calls with Mark. and. Uh, just tremendous stuff that he shares. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm a big fan and a uh, longtime basketball immersion member. So honored to be here. Well, immediately we want to get into focusing a little bit on the high school level because that's where you coach and talking a little bit about what does modern basketball look like at the high school level? Yeah, well, hopefully it looks very similar at all levels, really from the NBA, NCAA into high school. Main difference being the, um, the shot clock, but also the three-point line. So uh, the NBA's three-point line being further back changes the game. But as far as basic modern basketball, hopefully there, there's a lot of carry over there. First, hopefully it's transformational instead of transactional. Uh, we want to put a lot of focus on player and skill development. So we have an emphasis on players instead of plays. And as far as actual X's and O's goes, I think modern basketball is more about spacing the floor and ball movement on the offensive end teaching players what advantages are, playing more conceptual. A big part of it is playing off the catch or or what you would call zero-second decision-making. So uh, teaching much more or thinking much more in terms of advantages rather than just shots or or running offense. And I think modern basketball uh, for coaches is the ability just to be creative and be willing to find innovative solutions for the game. And, And that might mean you experiment a little bit or you try things that might be unconventional. but for me, that's that's the fun part of coaching. That's what I've really enjoyed in, in my own personal development. I love this. And, and the thing that I believe connects most is that your players enjoy playing this way. They enjoy playing this modern style. They enjoy having some freedom. And also, they enjoy the fact, and I want to clarify this, that when you say skill, you don't simply mean biomechanical technique-based skill. You mean decisions as well, because that encompasses skill for a basketball player. Yeah, absolutely. And I think first and foremost, we want our players to enjoy playing the game. And I think they enjoy how we play because they feel unleashed. I think their favorite part of the offense is the fact that they can be in attack mode on every catch and they don't have to overthink offense. And it's, you're right. It's not just the physical part. It's much more about building better decision makers. So our players can be technically sound but they're also able to apply those skills in game situations based on making the correct read or decision. Uh, And like I said earlier about modern basketball being about spacing and ball movement, really everything after that is just an application of their skills and decision-making. So uh, if we have this, the floor spaced, if we're moving the ball, it means everybody's getting a catch. They can play free to shoot the three attack gaps uh, and just share the ball with their teammates. It's really a fun way to play. And this conceptual approach sometimes comes with a little fear for coaches, but this doesn't mean the absence of structure. And that's what I've taken away, certainly from your stuff and some of your influences, Jimmy Tillett, Doug Novak, is this concept of there's a structure from which they develop freedom. Can you talk about that structure? I think you're right. I think some coaches really struggle with uh, giving up some control of the offense uh, and they feel like they're um, they're not going to be coaching. And then I think for other coaches, just kind of like a foreign language when we talk about conceptual offense and 
Uh, they're not quite sure how to teach it. So they don't know where to begin. And I was there too. And I, I still am. I learn something new every day about, uh, you know, best practices, the way to teach the offense or, or, or build skills and concepts within uh, our framework. But really that's exactly what we're providing players is just a framework that they can play out of. I think if you don't have enough structure, players feel like they're on an Island. Uh, and then if you have too much structure, players feel a little handcuffed. So we're trying to find that middle ground. And I think just teaching some concepts and teaching players how to play is that glue that kind of holds everything together where you're still coaching and you're still dictating uh, your actions and your spacing. Uh, But there's going to be a lot of freedom and a lot of randomness to the game within that. But that's to me, that's really, really hard to guard is when uh, you don't quite know what your opponent's going to do, but you know they're going to be in attack mode, they're going to have the floor space, they're going to move the ball. Uh, it, it's unscoutable. Uh, and, and like we said, fun to play in. So part of modern basketball, also in my mind, you've already mentioned is spacing. And let's talk about that, because what we mean is instead of spacing 45s and in line extended, we're talking about spacing corners and slots, 45, whatever term you use. Can you give us a little bit deeper dive on what you mean by modern spacing? Well, we talk more about gaps rather than feet when in terms of spacing. So uh, we used to talk about uh, being 15 to 18 feet apart on offense. Now we really just look at it as single gap, double gap, and triple gaps. And obviously everybody's trying to create triple gaps so you can attack off the bounce and have as optimal space. Um, and I think having clear rules on how we play through a single gap. Typically we're going to pass through a single gap since there's not a lot of space to drive and we're going to use our cuts to expand gaps. So let's turn a single into a double gap or let's turn a single into a triple gap. That way we're just optimizing our spacing. So we want to play really high, really wide. I know a lot of people now are talking about the four point line. Uh, So being, you know, really high on offense will allow you to stretch the defense horizontally like you talked about in, in the corners or, or 45s and then vertically too by, by playing behind that four point line and pulling the defense out and just making them guard as much of the floor as possible. Yeah, it's great stuff. And uh, having seen it in action too, I mean, that's the one noticeable thing is that essentially all of your sequences are designed to be able to create uh, at least a double gap and to be able to have someone attack that double gap. And then everything plays off of that player's decision, whether they shoot or obviously you're in penetration reaction and respace and different things like that. And, and that's why I love blending this with the zero seconds decision making, because all the action is really on the ball with us for the most part. Uh, so we're not a big triple threat team because I just think that lends itself to action off the ball. You know, we're waiting for something to develop. We're waiting for a cut to come off a screen where now we've got to be passers first. Um, And I think for a long time, I tried to blend those two elements together. And like you said, coaches can be intimidated by just playing conceptual. And honestly, I was the same way. And it's just because I didn't fully trust myself. I wasn't skilled enough as a coach to be able to, to really dive in the deep end. So the more I looked into it, it just made sense to make all the action on the ball. So we're putting pressure on the rim off the drive. And then like you said, that cues all the action around it. Uh, and and that we're not asking players to, you know, use your skills and, and play free, but also run the offense at the exact same time. You know, the offense is using your skills. And here's the other noticeable thing that I want you to talk about a little bit. And that's this concept that standing and holding a spot is positive spacing. And we were used to in the past, and you still hear this from announcers and stuff watching games. Oh, they need to have more action on the weak side or whatnot. But gravity and the, this concept of obviously being able to create space by holding a spot is just as important, isn't it? Yeah, it's so true. So a common question that I always get is, you know, when do you ask the, the player to come out of the corner? Or, uh, you know, what is your penetration rules? Um, off, you know, what are, your, what are your reaction rules off dribble? penetration. And uh, I probably don't give great answers because I just tell them what well, we only move when we need to, you know, if, uh, if, if you're driving into a triple gap and I'm not player in the corner, I'm on a need to know basis, right? Like I, you might not even need me to do anything for you to get your score. Uh, if my player is going to deny me and not help ball side in the corner, well, by standing in the corner, I'm actually 
you know, giving you space to make your play. So, um, you know, there are some guidelines you could teach, you know, if you're, if you're looking for something concrete, it could be when, when the offensive player puts two feet on the floor in, in a jump stop, maybe then you might need to shoot out of the corner to help them out. But, you know, that's something that you just learn by playing. And I think, you know, we're really big on our players playing pickup because that's what players need these days. I mean, there's so much one on O stuff with their trainer that uh, they just, they don't build that IQ of, you know, my teammate needs help here. My teammate needs space here. So I'm going to hold my spot. But um, if we're holding our spot, we're in a position to shoot stationary threes uh, rather than on the move. And that's what we're always looking for. I love that you connected that and you brought that up in this concept of team practice or coach led practice, coach led practice. The value of that is that you can develop skills within the context of the game. When players train on their own or they train with a trainer, player led development, they can work on those one on one skills and you can create that template for them to do that if you want as a coach. So we're not neglect that. We're just saying when Mark Cassio is there at practice, his goal and his advantage is that he can connect skills and decisions to the game. No doubt. And one way we'll do that is teach through cues. So we might uh, be working on a one on one skill or our players can work on this skill by themselves. But let's say the skill is uh, playing off two feet or a pro hop or a stride stop. We can give them cues to help them um, connect the skill to the application. So one cue that we'll use for playing off two feet would be when bodies are in front. So if I'm an, if I'm an offensive player and I'm driving to the basket and defensive bodies are in front of me, I need to play off two. If we think about where our charges come from, it's when we launch off one foot when bodies are in front of us, right? So if we're going to play off two feet when bodies are in front, now we can add defense. Uh, we love to do it small sided games because now I can shape an environment or I can shape a drill where I know there's going to be bodies moving in front of a drive. So maybe we'll start with a closeout or maybe we'll just start offense at an advantage and give the constraint that you can only drive if you're attacking a closeout. So when we attack that closeout, there's going to be defensive rotation where bodies are in front. Now we have to play off two where we apply that cue to the skill. Wait, let's say we pro hop a secondary defender. We stop one, two feet in the paint. We're looking to score. If we can't score, now our decision-making has slowed down. Uh, we're playing off two feet. And we're finding the right, uh, the right pass uh, out of the paint. And then we can play from there. All right, I like that connection. And uh, the other part that goes with this modern basketball and the way that you play is that you do value twos and threes, but you value twos at the rim and you value getting to the free throw line and then you value threes. Can you talk a little bit about how you teach it and how you hold your players accountable? Because the challenge, as we know, as we move down from, say, the NBA and we move down a level, we move down a level and we keep moving down a level down to youth basketball level. The challenge is the skill of the players to be able to execute this, you know, threes and layup type of philosophy. Yeah, we have definitely prescribed to the um, three key or free mentality as far as shot selection goes. So uh, we want to create stationary open threes, which we would call a big advantage shot or big advantage three. And then we want to create big advantage uh, shots at the rim, uh, which would just be an open layup. Uh, we also consider anything in the paint to be a layup. So we do have some, some pull up game in there, but we want that to be, um, we want our players to have the mentality that we're driving to score in the paint. And then again, uh, connecting the, the previous answer with, uh, playing off two feet. If there's bodies in front, I'm going to play off two. That might be, you know, an eight foot pull up jump shot. But again, to us, that's a layup. We're just not playing for the mid range. We don't really get into the analytics of, of, of why we do that with our players. Uh, most of the time, they don't, they don't ask. It's not a shot that they practice. So most of the time, they're not passionate about it anyway. Uh, but we always define our shots, uh, not by the result, but uh, whether it's a big advantage shot or a small advantage shot. Uh, so our players get really accustomed to that terminology and language. And I think that really helps connect uh, shot selection for them and, and valuing shots. And also, uh, whenever you use consistent terminology like that, I think your team starts to see the game through a common lens or through a common 
uh, point of view where uh, we know that the player with the biggest advantage should always take the shot. Uh, sometimes that is a small advantage shot. So if I'm driving to the rim and I don't draw a secondary defender, it means really I'm not forcing help. So there's not a big advantage three likely going to be available. So the best shot we have that possession might be a small advantage three. But if we can get a domino to fall, then we're likely creating a big advantage shot somewhere. So we'd use that small advantage and turn it into a big advantage shot. Talk to us about dominoes then. Uh, Ross McMahon's term, I think, is where most of us got it. So talk to us about dominoes in case coaches aren't aware of what that means. Yeah, so the simplest way to put dominoes to me is just offense has an advantage. So uh, neither team is neutral. Offense has created some type of advantage against the defense, whether that's attacking a long closeout or we've just beat our primary defender to where now the defense is compromised and we just have to use our advantage to find a big advantage shot. A lot of times uh, what I've seen on film, just watching other teams, they'll get a domino to fall. And I think two things happen where they can't continue to get those dominoes to fall or they lose the dominoes and the defense is able to get back neutral. They either catch and put the ball above their head and they lose advantage or the players off the ball are not spaced well enough to where we can't punish the defense. So if I drive and I draw help, and a secondary defender comes and cuts off my drive, well, we should have an open player, but really only if we're spaced well. So if I kick to that open player and they put the ball above their head and freeze with indecision, well, we've lost the advantage. So really dominoes is all about just just a a fancy term for advantage. Uh, We've used, you know, keep the advantage uh, in the past, but uh, our players really like the term dominoes. And, and, And when we watch film, I'll just, we'll put on a possession. I'll say, raise your hand when the first domino has fallen. And that's always fun to kind of see because there's a lot of gray area with offense, but it creates really good discussion within a team. Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to be able to visualize and define advantage. And, uh, you know, essentially for coaches, if you think about it the other way, the defense is now in scramble. So they're in recovery. And that's always the goal of advantage basketball is to put the offense, put the offense in advantage and the defense in disadvantage, and that's as simple as it gets. Yeah, talk and, and talk, right. I'm, I'm sorry, I was going to say, and one thing, uh, when you mentioned the defensive part, is that's a huge part of modern basketball. So um, having the same rules for offense and defense, but they're just the inverse. So uh, we, we've developed some drills, and just any of your small-sided games, I love putting offense at an advantage because it's going to make defense help. Uh, and I think I got this from you. Um, you know, the the goal of help defense is to force a pass, right? So what we've talked about on offense is if you see a chest in front of you, you should pass. You know, so it's the same concept, but now we can through a games based approach, we can train both sides of the ball where we're not doing 10 minutes of offense, 10 minutes of defense. It's defense. You're trying to get your chest in front of the ball to force a pass. Offense, if you see a chest pass. Uh, and I think we have gotten so much value in our practices from just teaching both sides of the ball with the same teaching point. Hey coach, I know I've told you about this before, but bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Football might be over, but NBA college basketball and the NHL are in full swing. Bet online even covers award shows, TV and reality TV, real time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine. BetOnline has you covered for all the news, scores, and odds. It's the best way to place your bets, and it's free to sign up. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. BetOnline, your sports book experts. Please use promo code ARMCHAIR at checkout. Well, and that's where I was going with this is the two-way teaching, which is your practice philosophy and the advantage of teaching the way you teach with small-sided games and then even defining if you define something so well for the offense, like you said, if you see their chest, then you're also defining something for your defense equally as well, which is this back and forth, which is, yeah, the offense wants to create this, but the defense wants to prevent this. So you're developing both sides of the ball at the same time. Yeah, no doubt. And, and I think I've grown a lot as coach doing this. And what I've gotten a lot better at is we have this small sided game or we're, we're playing in practice and we're not quite getting what we want. Well, then we can just we can make a tweak. It might be adding a constraint or taking a constraint away. That way we're getting what we want on both sides of the ball. And 
you know, I think giving very clear cues, like you said, having your language really tight. So, you know, if you see chest pass, if you see shoulder, keep driving, you know, and, and make them commit, or you might get all the way to the rim. And then from a skill development standpoint, it's all right, well, let's teach weapons from there. Right. So now I know the read where if I see chest, I should pass. You could Euro, you could pro hop, but now we're going to teach you different passes that you can make, whether it's a hook or a jump skip. And, um, and then that creates X out for defense. So uh, there's just so many things that are layered on top of each other. And then what we've done is we've created small sided games that will teach defense too. So one of our favorites is we call three on three cat. Everybody just guard their cat. Don't let your guy score where no one's going to play help. So we might be playing three on three where you're either going to be guarding the ball or the passing lane. There, there's no help. And at first I'm like, wait a second, we're going to play basketball and not teach help defense, you know, not hold them accountable for getting the help. But it's not like if you do this drill for five or 10 minutes, your players are going to forget what help defense is. But what it does is through playing, you're, you're basically playing one-on-one, but it's three-on-three. So it's more time on task. You're either guarding the ball or you're in the passing lane, which then offense knows there's not going to be help. So they're working on gaining an advantage and small advantage finishes, but you're also creating an environment where you're going to get some back cuts, where you're going to get some protection plans, um, but you're also teaching defense and how you want to play, whether you're an online line or, or a uh, pack line or in the gap. Well, I love that concept. We used to play a lot of three and three, four and four, no help. And again, for a defensive purpose is to get your guys to guard the ball because sometimes your help gets so good that you quit guarding the ball because you always know you'll have help as well. Yeah. And, and I, th- you know, that's a great point because what we've always done, and I, I've done this to a fault as a coach, is when my on ball defender gets beat and help is late, I'm, I'm mad at the help guy, you know, and I'm saying, hey, get the help. And I'm just bailing out the on ball defender. Uh, so really, you should diagnose that thing from the ball to the basket, you know, because it, a lot of times our coaches will be on our helpers now. And I, I'm just seeing it through a different lens of, man, when when we get blown by on the ball, pretty hard for help to get there, you know, pretty hard for that cover down to get there when we're just putting no resistance on the ball. So uh, great point with that. And um, and then when when we design our defense, we're designing it from the basket out. So it's kind of the opposite there. So for coaches, I mean, shot clocks are an administrative problem. Let's, let's clarify that. So any coach that plays slow without having shot clocks is essentially smart coaching, right? Like it's, we can't criticize them because they're playing within the rules and they're doing their best. What is their art? What is our argument to them to say, Hey, let's, let's play faster and let's go to this more modern basketball, even though they don't have a shot clock. Well, I think you're exactly right. It's an administrative problem, but also I want to be very clear. I don't convince anybody to play uh, our style of basketball. Do I believe in it? Absolutely. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. In fact, you know, uh, there, there's different champions every year and none of them run the same exact system. Uh, it's all about your execution and your philosophy. But if I was going to convince somebody to play fast, I might just uh, remind them. Uh, that it should be about the players and we should be pretty adapt. We should be adaptable to uh, the way the game is changing. So everything is going off the bounce. Uh, defense is getting better. So I don't think you would want to face a set defense on a lot of possessions, but teams that milk the clock or just take the air out of the ball. I mean, obviously they're using uh, the the rules that they have to their advantage to shorten the game. And there's nothing wrong with that, but, Again, I, I just think it's a fun way to play when you get up and down, you create more possessions. Uh, and, and I think whenever you are a team that is trailing, but you play with pace, you have a lot better chance of coming back in that game rather than being the team that wants to slow it down. And you're trailing, now there's going to be fewer possessions for you to come back. And it's just not your style to get up and down. So you're having to play into the other team's uh, style or into their hands anyway. But we just try to make the game fun and we try to make it more about the players where we feel like if our guys enjoy showing up every day because they're going to get to play a lot of basketball, they're going to be able to play the way they watch on TV, that they're going to fall in love with the game. And if you have players that love it and they want to be in the gym and they want to learn, I just I think you'll win more games. and I think it's just a lot more fun for everybody. 
Oh, well said. Well said. I mean, definitely athlete satisfaction, athlete enjoyment, and then development over the long haul. If we look at high school as a long-term development, a part of a long-term development model, then this is definitely a piece that helps them more than playing slow, just because there's more possessions in a game and more possessions give you more opportunity to be able to develop skill and to be able to apply it. So it's, it's such a huge part of it. So, you know, I'm grateful that you applied that. And again, nobody's wrong. <laughs> we, we know that, right. You can win playing doing, you can win running three man. We've all practice. Like if you have the players that can play. So, yeah, and, you know. and one, one thing I would say too, would be an argument is, when you play with some pace, you know, I, I just watching, you know, basketball, when teams walk it up all the time, again, they can do whatever they want. It doesn't make them wrong, like we said, but I, I just, you're facing a set defense every single possession, you know, and, and I just, I just think your points per possession is going to go down whenever that defense is getting back and getting set. And uh, so we try to arrive with some pace and it doesn't have to be breakneck speed. It doesn't have to be reckless. But if we can just arrive two to three seconds earlier, we're just putting that much more pressure on you. As those possessions stack up, we can see that team start to wear down mentally and physically in the second half. Which, which is fun and which is the goal of all this as well in terms of those things. So, uh, so we talked about two-way coaching. We talked about your spacing. Let's get into protection plans because this has been such a huge development in my coaching over the last 10 years is just developing this package of protection plans as a package, even though a lot of coaches employ a lot of these things, maybe separately, they don't package them the way that you do, which I think is one of the best things that you share. Yeah. So protection plans for those that that haven't heard that it's really just a plan B for a player. And the idea is that we're going to protect that player as they grow into their game. And as they develop as a player and just give them some options if they can't create an advantage or they just don't create an advantage on this particular situation. But um, we use protection plans when we're neutral. So we gained no advantage below the elbow a lot of times. So if I'm making an attack off the dribble and I drive and I'm neutral, I found that that's where we were just taking some really bad shots or we would leave our feet to find a pass. Um, and, And it just, I, I hate driving neutral and throwing out to a neutral player. It's just, you're delaying the inevitable, especially if you have a shot clock. But um, so using protection plans, we have a few, we have a Nash, which is uh, some people with hockey call it a Gretzky, where you're just going to keep your dribble alive uh, and usually dribble underneath the basket. And we just say, when in doubt, keep the bounce. So if we're going through the elbow and we're just going super fast, we don't know what read we have or, we're undecisive, just when in doubt, keep the bounce. Um, and, and then another one would be if we get pushed off our line uh, against a physical defender, or if we are a big physical player, it's a way to post your perimeters where they can dribble into a post up, where we tell our guys, think of it as two different attacks. You're attacking from the perimeter. If they guard that, let's reattack from the post. And it's a great way to invert your offense. For us being more five out in the past few years, it's been a great way for us to get a four out one in look. Um, And then, you know, there's other ones as far as like a donut or a rondo, the pivot. If we get our defender uh, really opening up their hips and sprinting with speed to cut us off, that's a great move from a stride stop. And then, you know, it's kind of even evolved into just playing off two feet when and there's bodies in front of us. We want to go off two and be patient on two. We just find that everything slows down when you have these plan B's where just because you're attacking hard doesn't mean that you have to make a really fast decision. Once you get inside the three point line, the way we work this in offense, super easy. We can get it in the small sided game stuff, but also anytime we play one-on-one, if defense does their job, theoretically it should end with a protection plan because we gained no advantage. So it's super easy to train. Um, as we do it, you know, we play a lot of one-on-one. So as we do it, guys become more and more comfortable with one or two. Uh, and they really just, we can hone in on that and just teach them some, some different things out of that. But I've, I think the one thing that it's really stood out for us is we take far better shots in a paint. It leads to a lot of, um, of open threes, but uh, it also just eliminates those one foot launches where we're off balance and just those key points that we can train every single day has really, really made a huge difference in our program. 
Well, and, and if any coach that coaches, uh, you, you know, youth level or, you know, JV level and below, I mean, you should probably start your practices with protection plans and start your season from protection plans. Because essentially we're teaching players how to get out of trouble. And we know at that age, if you start with the end in mind, you know, they're going to get in trouble because they simply don't have the skill to be able to, as you talked about, continue their drive or to always create an advantage. So that's such an important part of teaching players is to get them to be able to enjoy the game by teaching them how to be able to essentially game the game. Yep. And, and there's a lot of times where I'm watching other teams play. They've got some super athletic players and they're really good off the balance and coach is doing a lot of great things. They're spacing the floor, they're creating advantages, they're attacking closeouts. Uh, and just they're taking some really, really tough shots at the rim where I'm just kind of watching well, either on film or live. And I'm just like, man, if they had some protection plans, like they would be next level good because they would just find solutions so much easier rather than just forcing. Uh, and that's what the game's all about. That's what you know, all the decision making stuff that we're talking about. It's really just punishing the defense by finding solutions. Coach, this is a great segue into talking about the overall development within your program. Can you talk to me a little bit about the progression from ninth grade on up in terms of the process of developing players? Because this is very common from high school coaches. A question that I've got asked is how you run feeder programs and then how you develop once they're at your school within what you do. Sure. Yeah, I wish we had feeder programs, actually. So we get our guys uh, as ninth graders and really they are blank canvases it's a big jump up in level when they get to us as ninth graders. And we just start at the very beginning. So we would treat them like we do as a sixth grader. And that's not an insult. It's just, we've got to build this from the ground up. So literally we just start with their feet and we start teaching them how we want to catch the ball. If they want to hop into it, or if they want to one, two step, it's really, really doesn't matter to me as long as they're doing what they're comfortable doing and they can recreate that. So we'll start with passing and catching. We go right into shooting off the catch, and then we just kind of go through point five and start, um, you know, teach them the zero second decision making that we're going to start with the mentality that we're going to shoot a three. So let's make sure we're working our feet and getting shot prep. Uh, we'll work a little bit with their shot. I'm honestly, I'm not huge into just restructuring kids' shots because I don't know that they're in the gym that much uh, to really commit to that. So if there's something, you know, that's that's making the ball go left to right or something obvious that we can just make small adjustments, we'll do that. Um, and then from there, it's attacking closeouts. So we love, um, you know, a split step drive or a stampede drive where we're going into our catch. Uh, we'll work on them playing off the bounce. And then again, it's about finding those solutions. So if you get this drive, what could happen? Well, you could the goal is to finish off one foot. If there's bodies in front, now we're going to finish off two feet. If uh, defense forces a pass, these are the options that you have. These are the passes that you need. So just like you said earlier, just beginning with the end in mind, right? So these are the things that we're going to need to punish the defense. And we just work backwards from there. As far as how we phase it from ninth grade to JV to varsity, every team is, is so different, uh, especially you know for us at the ninth grade level, some years, uh, the coaches change. Some years the the players just pick up on it quicker. Some years we have more or less practice time. So it's really hard to have a concrete plan that you're going to take year to year. But the base of it is we're going to start at ground zero and we're going to go as far as we can. Uh, because really that's what we do at the JV and varsity level too. I mean, we, we are always reinforcing the, the basics. It's not like we've ever mastered, um, you know, footwork there's always something you can add to it you've never mastered shooting or passing uh there's just different levels of expertise that we can bring to it but let's also paint the image that you're not just doing pivoting drills in isolation right you're incorporating them within protection plans you're incorporating them within the small-sided games and essentially a good small-sided game just takes a piece of the game and says okay we're going to we're going to shape this we're going to shape pivoting to get out of trouble within the game. Can you talk to me about how you incorporate skills like pivoting or whatever one you want into your small sided game? So you're developing the skill within the context of the game. Yeah. So and even before getting to the small sided games, we will put footwork into our shooting drills where if we're getting if we're shooting, 
Um, you know, we'll get some comfort and confidence shots where we're just getting volume, especially early. It's usually like a pre-practice thing. And then within practice, we're building in an attack of a closeout into a shooting drill. So we might shoot, you know, five threes, and then we're going to end with a, you know, a shot off two feet in the paint. And then our last rep is going to end with a protection plan. That way we're just building in footwork, attacking closeouts into shooting drills. And then we can use a small sided game. That's going to put that player in the exact same situation. So by starting a player with a small sided game, you know, we're, but with a small advantage within a small sided game, we're putting him in a position where they're trying to create their advantage. But if they don't, we know it's likely going to end with a pivot or a protection plan. And that's the, that's the exact skills that we used right before we, we went into this small sided game. So um, I think we've just, we've developed and gotten a lot better as coaches, as far as creating those things within the small sided games. Um, you can even start from uh, playing one-on-one in the post or, you know, three on three, let's say, but you're going to start with one-on-one in the post with no dribble. So you're going to, you know, spin middle, pivot middle, look for an up and under pivot again. If that, it's not open, we kick out and play. So just tons of possibilities where you can build that into live situations. Well, and I would say that is the one advantage of post play. And we, we still played a lot of one-on-one in the post. And the main reason was it was footwork, right? And you have to learn how to use your pivots to create advantage or out of a disadvantage. And that's such an important part of it. So with no dribble or with a few dribbles, whatever it may be, playing in the post is such an important part of developing pivoting. Yeah, because footwork is footwork. It's all the same, whether it's, it's, you know, 20 feet away from the basket or two feet away from the basket. So we're always developing players as just basketball players where they're all going to do everything. We look at the post as a place of attack, not a position. So we want all of our guys comfortable in there. And, uh, and we tell our guys, really, a pivot should be like a screen for yourself. Uh, if you're not pivoting to score, you should be pivoting to increase your vision and get better position on your defender. Well, I love it. And the fun part about playing in the post is obviously you're close to the basket, so you get a chance to shoot. And that's always a big part of development is the enjoyment of getting to shoot the ball at the end of it. So that's cool. Another part I want to come back to with protection plans. And this is something that I saw the first time that we worked together and we did a clinic together and incidentally coaches, if you want to connect with us, uh, we're, we're doing combined clinics. We've already got a few this year. We're happy to come to your place or to do a combined clinic for you where we combine our stuff together. Uh, And one of the things I took away from the first one I did with you was this concept off of a protection plan, particularly a pullback dribble or some type of dribble out, where now on that pass, you're initiating a specific offensive sequence. It's almost like you're queuing a play. Because the way you phrased it, if I understand, was when we attacked, we didn't get a chance to score. So when we back it out, we want to get into a quick hit action so that we get a chance to score off of that. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah, so that's that's been something that's been great for us. So usually we use the Nash, Barkley, or Donut when we're below the elbow and we're neutral. We use that back off dribble when we're above the elbow and neutral. So if we just, you know, a lot of times the the protection plan below the elbow, you've gained a small one and then you lost it. With the back off dribble is is you've made an attack move and you've gained no advantage. So when we're chest to chest, and I said earlier, I, I what I'm trying to eliminate is our guys driving without an advantage and picking the ball up because everything stalls and we just don't have that flow to where now defense can really lock in and we're just in survival mode, right? Just throw it over the defense to somebody and let's reset. And we don't want the reset to happen within offense. So that back off dribble allows us to flow into some action and you can just flow into your normal core offense. What we've used that as is now we can back off dribble and that cues a a set, a call, a play, a certain action for us. Uh, And and we've changed what we do out of that over the years, depending on personnel or our half court alignment. Uh, But it's I've looked at it this way. If we can't gain an advantage with our drive and space game and just trying to get downhill and playing through big gaps, then we might need something else, right? Like we might need a ball screen or we might need an off ball screen. So that cue of, okay, we've driven the ball a couple of times. 
we have no advantage. Let's lift the ball out and see if we can create advantage another way without us having to install a secondary offense or without players having to reset and look for coach uh, for a play call. So it's a way to keep them flowing, but we're, we're kind of throwing a little change up at the defense as well. Well, I also, I also love it just because, you know, from a coach's perspective, you give them freedom, right? And then the freedom didn't work. So now it's like, okay, let's get to a structure that can possibly lead back to freedom. And that's really helps you as a coach when you're coaching this level, especially because they don't necessarily know how to flow into some of these sequences that make sense. So you're making some of these attack sequences or based on scout or whatever it may be, you're making them essentially automatics that they can go to. Yeah. So uh, a, a possession could look like this, like you said, freedom or structure, you know? So if we just use those two terms, it would be, we're going to come down half court and, and play, right? Play free within our, our framework. If that doesn't work, we back it off. Now we're going to structure. But when that structure creates an advantage, whether we, you know, we come off a screen and force a closeout, well, now we're right back into that free play. So we're just going to kind of flow in and out, in and out, in and out until we get a big advantage shot. So uh, you're exactly right. It kind of, it's almost like a team protection plan for us, where if we just can't get it done, we have something that we can flow into to help us create an advantage a different way. I love it. Talk about KPIs, key performance indicators in your program. Let's start maybe with individuals. What are some important key performance indicators? Yeah, so what we've done, and I believe I got this from the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, actually. So if I'm watching film of our team, each player has a key performance indicator. And it's it's almost like their role on the team, but it's like if if they were just going to do one thing in this film, what would I want to see from them? So we have some guys that are our more dynamic guys off the bounce. So their KPI or key performance indicator would be man, every time you get a double or a triple gap, we need you, we need you getting into that gap with the bounce. You know, you're the domino guy is what we would tell them. Like you get the first domino to fall for us. And then we're going to evaluate how you get, you know, your decision making from there, right? Uh, for a guy that's a shooter, it might be. And we really need you to run all the way to the corner in transition, or you got to be a guy that's really good at holding your spacing when somebody's attacking a gap in your direction. So it's just for another guy, it might be uh, protection plans, you know, like you're a guy that, that gets downhill a lot. What we need to see from you is a, a great use of protection plans. So it's really clearly defining their roles. And then we have a coach that's in charge of player development where when he watches film, that's what he's looking for. As the head coach, I'm kind of looking more of our team key performance indicator. So I think uh, it's important for coaches to know, and this could change, uh, you know, in phases of the year. Some coaches I've talked to that have limited practice time, especially with COVID this year, it's just, all right, you have five practices. If you watch game one, what's one thing you want to see from your team defensively? Like what, what's that one thing that's going to say, Hey, all right, we're working hard, or this is what our game plan is. It might be, we're up in the passing lanes, right? So defensively, I know that if we're up in the passing lanes, we're at least being disruptive. Our one ball defense might not be where it needs to be right now. Our help defense might not be, our rotation might not be great, but if we're in the passing lane, we're at least being disruptive to the offense where that would be our team KPI defensively. Offensively, it could be pace. You know, are we, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, coaches try to get the ball across half court in four seconds. So that could be your KPI. How many possessions did we get the ball across half court within four seconds? If we're doing that, we know we're putting pressure on the defense in transition. So I think our players have really enjoyed that. That helps them kind of hone in on their role. Um, it helps us do our pre-practice stuff. You know, a lot of the coaches are using vitamins pre-practice. A lot of those are geared toward our KPI. And I post my practice plan every day for practice. I used to hide it as the head coach, and I don't know why. I just didn't want our players to know where I thought they might pace themselves, I guess, throughout practice. Um, I actually polled the team and just asked them, you know, would you rather see practice ahead of time? And it was a resounding yes. So as the head coach, why wouldn't I do that? So I post it every day. That's the first thing they go look at when they come from class. 
us. They'll look at what we're doing as a team, and then they look at their KPI and their vitamins. So they know when they get dressed and ready, they're working on their vitamins. And it gives me an opportunity to go connect with each player before practice. And it's just like a built-in excuse to go talk to him about his role, which I think we could all as coaches do more, right? But that KPI is your role, what you're evaluating on. And now you can go into practice with a clear objective. For the most part, they stayed the same for guys over the year because uh, through the course of the season, your role is probably going to be the same. Sometimes they would flip between offense and defense a little bit, uh, just depending on the, you know um, how they were playing because the, the season's full of ups and downs. Hey, Coach, I know I've told you about this before, but Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Football might be over, but NBA, college basketball, and the NHL are in full swing. Bet Online even covers award shows, TV, and reality TV. Real time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine. Bet Online has you covered for all the news, scores, and odds. It's the best way to place your bets, and it's free to sign up. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, your sports book experts. Please use promo code armchair at checkout. Hey coach, brief interruption to tell you about eBay sneakers. From rare dead stock to the latest release, you can find the exact sneaker you've been looking for on eBay. As the original sneaker marketplace, eBay is the place to go to get the pair you've been eyeing. And with eBay's Authenticity Guarantee, a team of independent professional authenticators perform a rigorous inspection of the sneakers you purchase before they're sent to you. So you can shop confidently knowing your pair is the real deal. And for the sneaker sellers out there, eBay has eliminated selling fees on sneakers $100 or more, making it free to sell or flip your collection. With other sites taking as much as 25%, you're going to have a lot of extra money left for more sneakers. Check out ebay.com slash sneakers today. I love it. And I'm curious then with, with your style and the way that you guys play, do those KPIs change based on the players that you have from year to year or based on, because your, your system, your style doesn't essentially change. I know there's tweaks and there's differences, but does it change much based on players that you have in your program? I would say there's going to be a lot of common denominators, you know, because we have our domino guys that that just really need to attack off the bounce. We have our guys that shoot it better than than other guys. So a player's KPI will change from year to year, but I'm using a lot of the same ones from year to year, you know. So one player that his KPI, you know, we had a player in our program this year, his KPI was to be a ball mover, where if I put on film and I was watching film of Jimmy I would just want to see him 0.5. He's moving that ball. He's not letting it stick, which means he's not getting a lot of shots and he's not getting a lot of drives, but that's what we needed him to do is just be a ball mover. Next year, that same player could be our domino guy. And that's the fun part about development, right? Like you never know where players are going to go. You never know what role they're going to end up having. And I think that's what makes it fun for coaches, but also as players is, you know, they can go into next year with a completely different role because of how hard they worked and, and their new role in, on next year's team. Well, I love that. And, and I love that, that that connects back to this is on the player more than the coach. Like their role can change, but so much of that comes back to the player and how, how they'll work and how they'll develop on their own beyond just the coach. Yeah, no doubt. And that's where, you know, and you can tell the guys like I'll, I'll walk around like, hey, man, what's your KPI today? And the guys that always know, the guys that didn't forget to look at it or the guys that didn't forget what it was, those are always the guys that are just so invested. Those are the guys that are coming in on Saturdays when you open the gym because, you know, they're, they're really bought into the, the program. But more importantly, they're bought into their self and they're not putting a ceiling on their self. It's that whole growth mindset thing, right? So uh, that's been really fun to see. And you could tell the guys that are super locked into that. Love it. Love it. And then. For me, a question that comes up is if you play pace and space, can you do it with a non-athletic team? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I always say like this year, we weren't as athletic as we've been in the past few years, but this was probably our most skilled team. So I just, you know, your athleticism might not be there every year, but I think our skills are going to get better because you're, you have a program, right? And you're working on those same skills every year because the end result is always the same. We're trying to create the same shot. So working backwards, what skills do we need? 
I think arriving with some pace and, and playing in the full court can benefit you when you're not as athletic because you're not going toe to toe when you're neutral. Right. So if we can just get a little bit more pace, then we're getting an advantage. And really our program on and off the floor has become about creating advantages because we are not the most athletic team. We are not the most talented team around. So we're trying to find any advantage that we can. Now, is there times where you have to slow it down where the game calls for that? Absolutely. You know, time and score is really important, but um, I think, you know, at all levels, ninth JD varsity, when we are playing with pace, it doesn't matter who we're playing against. The game is in our favor because that's how we practice. That's how our players are comfortable. That's the environment that we're used to training in. And, and skills are the skills can trump a lot of things, but obviously skills are the things that leverage those advantages. And that's where I think people kind of fall in love with athleticism. But then, you know, skill is the thing above all else that helps everything else open up in terms of offensive advantage. So such a key part. I think I know the answer to this. Do you do any specific conditioning drills? We do not. Um, I did know the answer. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that's just kind of the way, like, we never did, you know, when I was an assistant or anything, just because we practice really hard. You know, I think playing basketball is the best conditioner in the off season. We play as much pickup as we possibly can. Um, I, I, and really, like, I'm not well-versed enough to watch my team run sprints and decide if we're in shape or not. <laughs> you know, like, I just... I don't know. I just, I feel like we build up to that by just playing a lot of basketball in practice. Um, we don't even run guys for discipline or anything because it just that's good for you, right? Like, you know, running is good for you. And I just, I, I know me personally, if I'm playing basketball, I can run for hours, but if I'm just outside running, it just, it feels like torture for me. <laughs> Agreed. And, you know, the other part is that you, and you can tell based on everything you've said so far, if you're taking time in practice or in workouts to condition your team, you're taking time away from connecting skills and decisions to the game. And that's the part that helps a player enjoy the game more and experience more success. So to me, it's, it's, it's a no brainer to focus on playing the game and conditioning through the game. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and if your practices aren't hard enough to where you're getting in shape, then I think you need to reevaluate your practices, you know, just more time on task and, and alternating hard drills with some drills that are maybe in the half court, but we want to go, I mean, how do you, how do you start the game, right? How does every coach want to start the game is we want to start fast. Well, your practices should start pretty fast too. You know, that way when you go to the gym every day, you're just used to getting yourself going and starting fast right away. Our practice philosophy is we're going to start fast. We're going to play really hard, really intense for as long as we can. And then we can't, we're done. You know, we, we've had a great practice. We've competed uh, and we can go home and, and rest and get ready for another day. What are some tactics or strategies that your opponents have used against you that you feel have been successful or have helped neutralize part of what you do? Good question. So I think uh, everybody kind of tries to counter us a little differently. We'll have teams that will put some soft pressure on us to slow down our pace. Uh, and a lot of time in the past, that's been pretty successful when we allow it to be, you know, when, when we're not getting stops, when we're fouling a lot, uh, when we're not running our lanes in transition, we've had to tell our guys, look, like this is what they're trying to do and they're winning at it. So we've got to change something. You know, a lot of times, being better on defense is going to help your pace offensively and so on. So that's one thing that that's that we've seen a lot. Um, we also just see a lot of pressure. Just I think the the number one thing that would give us problems is when we face better athletes that just get in us. They're really physical uh, and they make things difficult on us. We see some some like sagging D or pack line D. I, I mean, it, nothing wrong with that defensive style. It's obviously a, a great defense, but for us, since we play so high and wide, we're able to move the ball kind of freely. Um, so if you look at the pressure man and the man, we should be using a lot of protection plans. So if you're making us score in post against bigger, stronger guys, or you're just, you're not letting us pass the ball, you're not helping a whole lot. So you're making us create an advantage or get the domino to fall one-on-one. -on -one, that's been something that's been really effective. But uh, and then, you know, teams will just honestly, some teams will try to trap us and just kind of scramble. 
I don't mind that as much because you're, if we can pass out of that trap, well, you're giving us the domino, you know, because you're bringing two to the ball intentionally. Uh, and, and we've had a lot of success going two passes out of the trap, and then we're just playing big advantage basketball. So a lot of ways to do it. Honestly, a lot of times it's more about the, uh, just the opponent's players and, and you know, their, their athleticism and, and their physicality. Coach, at our combined clinic, another thing that uh, struck me was how coaches kind of get bogged down in the four out versus five out debate. And, and to be honest, your system is one that's adaptable to both. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so we were four out for a really long time. That's, you know, everybody comes to me for five out stuff, but equal, I like the four out equally. It's just, um, you know, years of running four out, what I found was, we weren't positionless, right? Obviously, we, we were putting a post player in there. Um, but one through four, we were positionless. And then we got to a point in our program where we just really didn't have any post players anymore. I mean, we had some big dudes, but uh, I don't know if it was just, you know, guys coming to our school or um, whatever it was. We just, I was kind of struggling to find guys that were going to be our posts. And instead of just saying, okay, you're the tallest guy, you're going to be in the post. I just kind of put the pressure on myself to how can we run what we run five out? So we wanted to maintain a two guard front. So it's kind of an atypical five out. And I just let my personnel dictate. So we run really the same offense, but you know, this past year we, we shifted to a four out because we had a legit post player that we could play through. And the beauty is that it's all the same offense. It's, it's the same attack. It's the same cuts. It's the same concepts, but our alignment's just going to be different. So, um, you know, some things with four out is you're going to get some, maybe some more offensive rebounds because you got the biggest guy around the basket, but they're going to have their biggest defender at the basket a lot. So there's going to be less space at the rim, but more space on the perimeter. In five out, we're not putting a big defender at the rim all the time. So there's more space at the basket less space on the perimeter. You're going to have an extra single gap out there. But also what I, what I think the value or, or some, a benefit that I didn't even realize from five out when we first started running this is it's really helped our decision making because when we gain an advantage, we know that the next pass is likely going to the perimeter. So we don't have to read where did the help come from quite as much because usually the answer is help came from the perimeter. So that's where we're going to pitch it. That's been an added bonus for us. One thing that, again, that I didn't foresee when we kind of shifted to this is a, qu a question I get a lot is, well, when we make this pass, do we fill out to this side or that side? When you're five out, it doesn't matter. The answer is whatever one your kind of momentum is taking you towards because our alignment is not balanced anyway when we're in five out since we have that two guard front. So it just kind of changes what side of the floor we're going to be overloaded on. It's great stuff and it's, it's great concepts and it's easily adaptable to what your personnel is. Either or is fine and either or works. And uh, that's what I love about this hybrid system that you use. And, uh, you know, a number of coaches are, are, are using these mixed kind of hybrid systems of, you know, the easiest way might just say like you're playing fast with pace and space, Princeton, and then dribble drive type of offensive stuff as well. And it incorporates all those things essentially, right? Sure. Yeah. Um... One thing I've, I've liked is finding ways to make it open post too, to where if you have five out personnel, but you really want a rim runner or you really want, you know, somebody in the dunker spot, just finding some creative ways to, to move everybody there where you don't really have to have positions. Um, and then, you know, also something to consider is what's your alignment going to be when you do drive it in, you know, so if you're four out one and you drive it in, you're kind of three out two in now. Uh, if you're five out, what I've really liked is now when we drive it in, we're four out one in where we can fill four perimeter spots, have a lot of room at the rim for protection plans and kick out and play from there. So there's tons of advantages for both. I'd, I'd advise coaches don't overthink it. Just what does your personnel dictate? And you can run a lot of the same stuff where from year to year, if you change, you're running the same offense. You're just tweaking it not to your players, but for your players to allow them uh, to play at optimal, you know, positions and attacks for you. Well, you raised another concept, which, which I really like is that concept of uh, when you drive it and you kick it, you aren't automatically empty, emptying, right? You're, you're holding the post for a second to be able to see where the next 
play goes before you empty anyway. So essentially a lot of times, even if you're five out, you're becoming four out one in until that next penetration, right? Yeah. And, and that way players can play to their strengths too. You know, sometimes our, our, our bigger players are not our quickest. So we can look for opportunities for them to drive, pitch it, and then we can get it right back to them in the post with a, with a fresh dribble, right? So they haven't used their dribble yet. Um, and then they, it, it, we do want them to space hard whenever they have that decision, but a lot of times they're playing off the ball. And common question I get is like our spacing isn't, isn't, or is getting bogged down or, you know, what happens if this happens? And a lot of those issues will resolve themselves if you're playing point five. So if I drive and kick and I'm holding my spot and, you know, and we catch and go, you know, two out of the paint and we shoot it, well, it's like I haven't really had move the time to move out of there anyway or cut, you know, anyway, it's just a lot of times those issues seem like issues when we're catching and holding the ball because uh, we're allowing them to become issues. So it goes back to like, let's make sure we're, we're, we're solving the right problem. If you foresee something, a lot of, a lot of times, coaches will ask a bunch of questions. Well, what if this happens? Well, what if this happens? And the answer is always the same. Like just play 0.5 and everything else figures itself out. So another thing I want to ask you about is this concept of marginal gains and how do they impact your program and how you run a program? Yeah. So, um, you know, we talk about advantages on the court all the time, right? Let's create an advantage. Let's attack closeouts. And I feel like we do a really good job of using advantages off the court as well. And it, it, it's because it's a necessity. You know, eight years ago when I, when I got to my current school, it became very clear that if we're going to win and win big, we need to do a lot of things right on and off the court. So uh, it's, it's really evolved. And I think the, the, the best way that we've been able to find marginal gains is I just keep a running journal throughout the year of things that come up or things that we can do better. And sometimes we can implement them right away, but other times it's okay, next year, this is what we, we can tweak. So for example, it might be uh, hydration, you know? So something I identified early, like let's not ever have a guy cramp and let's just, you know, when you're better hydrated, you have more energy, you're gonna stay healthy. Um, you're not gonna get sick as much. So we're gonna have guys at more practices, more games. So every player has their own water bottle. And then what we kind of changed towards next year was, well, every player has their own bottle and it's a clear bottle. So coaches can see how much water's in it throughout practice. That way, if it gets empty, a manager can go fill it. Before, we wouldn't know if they were empty or not. So just little things like that, taking notes of, um, of team meals that our guys like, right? So, um, favorite team meals and how much money it costs. Like I know for our guy to, for our team to get their favorite team meal, it's $46. So if I'm talking to somebody and they say, Hey, what can I do to help? Or, Hey, you need anything? I would say, yeah, I need $46. You'd buy us a complete team meal that, that my wife can cook for the team. Or, um, another thing that I always keep notes of is when teachers start piling on the test. Right. Because there's always those weeks within a school year, whether it's before a holiday or, you know, a uh, few weeks into the semester where this is kind of like that test cycle. Or maybe we might take a day off or we might, you know, go 30 minutes shorter a day just to keep our guys mentally fresh. Uh, just little things like that of taking notes, being organized. It's really helped our scheduling, too, where I can keep track of school events or just. Um, you know, events off campus for our guys that might, you know, hey, I can't come to practice this Sunday because I have this event at church or something. Just taking notes of those where ahead of the time we can say, let's practice on this day because we know a lot of our guys are going to miss this weekend practice coming up. So always looking for ways to create advantages. Uh, it's been a game changer within our program. And obviously it just makes your life easier as a coach to be proactive with a lot of these uh, issues that can come up. Well, I love it. I love it. I mean, that food example is a great one of just the specificity of the ask, which I always found so helpful when I was fundraising was not asking for generic numbers, but asking for very specific numbers that so solved very specific things. And I always found that my alumni in particular, or any type of donor was much more attuned to donating when they knew it was going to something very specific. Yep. They always want to see where their money's going. That's for sure. 
Totally. Such a good thing. And so many of these things are just such great, great topical things related specifically to high school coaches and high school programs and running a program. I'm wondering if there's anything else from a high school program perspective that you can share with us. From a high school perspective, we're we're always wanting, you know, the the resources that the next level has, right? So whether it's time with the guys, whether it's our own time, or maybe we don't have to be in the classroom, whatever it is, I've found, you know, some ways to save some time where we don't all have to be together. And I think COVID has taught us that too. You know, one thing we've done is we've adapted some video scouts, just things where, you know, they have a cell phone, you know, they're at home with the computer where instead of taking 15 to 20 minutes to watch film as a team, I'll just film, you know, film or uh, screen record my screen. I'm walking through the film and narrating uh, the film. And then I just send it to the guys and you might send them one or two questions that they have to answer or some kind of reflection to where that 15 to 20 minutes that you're saving every day of film, we're getting the film in, but we're also getting 15 to 20 more minutes of practice using Google forms for things to collect information and has been really great where I can send them an email throughout the school day and I can gather information throughout the school day that helps me plan that practice. For instance, we'll send them a wellness form where I will send them a Google form in the morning and they tell me what their legs feel like, what they ate for breakfast, what color their urine is, where I can see how hydrated they are without even having to put my eyes on them. Um, so, you know, just a lot of things like that, where we kind of wish that we had more resources, but we could probably find better ways to, to use the resources that we do have. Well, and again, it speaks to the fact that you're going to find a way to do the best you can within the resources you have and not spend all this time, you know, complaining about problems or different things that you really don't have control of. And it, and so much about what you talk about, and I think all the best high school coaches I've ever been around it's solution-based coaching, right? It's finding solutions. It's not worrying about the problems or complaining about the problems. Yeah, because there's solutions out there. It just might not be your first choice, you know? And uh, if we're focused, it's just like with players, right? Like if we're in practice and I'm focusing on the negative, I'm really just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find it, right? But if I'm in practice and I'm looking for the good, even if we're being really crappy on the court, you know, like one thing that sticks out is, um, you know, we're, we're playing five on five and, and defense is working on their press and offense is just turning the ball over every possession, right? I, I could get really, really mad at the offense or I could be really fired up for our defense. Both are going to send the same message. It's just, what are we going to focus on? So a lot of the other stuff, lack of resources, lack of time, I don't have this. Focus on what you do have, focus on the good. And I just think that that brings good mojo, you know, just being grateful for what you have, and especially in a year where some guys didn't get to coach, be thankful that we can and, and use all the resources you have to take your program to its ceiling. I think that's our job as coaches is we all have ceilings on our program, take it to the ceiling and enjoy the ride. Coach, nothing better to end on than that message. Uh, just great stuff. Thank you so much for sharing the game with us. And, uh, Coaches, if you don't know Mark Cassio, then make sure you you check him out. Uh, he's a great sharer online and just uh, so many tremendous things that he shares and uh, through courtside uh, consulting and, uh, you know, through his personal stuff as well. And uh, Mark's always willing to talk basketball. So reach out to him. Thanks for having me, man. You know, I'm a huge fan. Keep doing what you're doing. Appreciate you. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review and subscribe to the show and to give the basketball podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things basketball immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.